Okay. <clears throat> uh, hello again. Uh, my name is Neil Lee. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Finance here at NHK. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning um, to talk about our latest uh, offering, the Link SFR um, uh, in, in Frisco, Texas. Um, this would be our fifth uh, investment uh, opportunity under NHK. Um, and our third in our DFW um, SFR series with uh, uh, Stillwater Capital Partners um, as, our, as our sponsor. So uh, this is the final of the, the three DFW SFR series. Um, so, and for those of you who have joined us in the past, um, our first SFR project, DFW SFR project was in Storybook uh, uh, in McKinney, Texas. Um, and our second was the reserve at Mansfield, uh, Texas, which is a southern suburb of, of, of uh, DFW. Um, couple housekeeping items. Um, we will go through um, the, the analyses and why we think SFR is, is a good opportunity in general. Um, and at the end of the uh, the, the presentation, we'll have an FAQ session, a uh, Q&A session. So if you have questions throughout this uh, presentation, uh, don't hesitate and, and uh, upload it in, into the, your, your uh, uh, Q&A uh, window. Or, uh, and, and Matthew Temple uh, will be collecting them and addressing them at the end. So who we are, um, NHK Capital Partners, um, our, our mission statement is to provide our investors uh, with risk adjusted options um, in, in, in the US uh, alternative investment, uh, more focused into commercial real estate sector. Uh, the principles of NHK, uh, we have been in business since the, the last 25 years um, under CMB, which I think a lot of you are more familiar with. Um, and therefore, we have the the knowledge, the expertise, and the the relationships to you know to to continue to build these successful uh, investment uh, projects in the commercial real estate sector. Um, and again, uh, CMB Regional Centers. Uh, it's it, it, we're one of the the largest uh, EB five uh, regional center. Um, in business, um, and uh, you know, over the years since 1997, uh, we've raised over three billion dollars um, in EB5 capital, and uh, we have a staff that uh, speaks. I think now we're counting about 13 languages, um, and you know, together we represent uh, 5,800 over 500 uh, high net worth clients um, from you know uh, over 100 uh, different countries. And um, our ability to structure um, deals in the commercial real estate sector as a private lender of, of EV5 capital and as a private equity investor under the NHK banner truly does uh, afford us to, to seek um, you know, niche opportunities and to really customize the, the need uh, for those sorry, uh, for those projects um, so that we leverage a, a higher return for our investors. Um, so if you're, you're uh, more comfortable with any of the languages that are represented here, uh, we can accommodate, you know, from Russian, Korean, uh, even Wolof, uh, Vietnamese, uh, Mandarin, of course. Um, so, you know, give us a shout and uh, we'll be able to, to assist you. Uh, going on to kind of the, the, the investment thesis here um, and why SFR and why now, um, trying to address those two questions. Um, this might sound a little repetitive for those who have uh, you know, joined us in our last two uh, webinars that we talked about um, you know, under the, the DFW SFR series. Um, so I will try to go through it pretty quickly. Um, you can always go back and uh, find our previous uh, webinars posted on our website. 
Um, it, so if, if you're more curious about the other two projects and talking about the, this investment thesis into uh, single family rental homes, you're more than welcome to, to visit us at, at our website. So um, to go in, um, why do we think SFR is a good, good idea? Uh, well, there are a couple of trends that were followed. Uh, first is a, is a more, you know, a, a larger demographic trend whereby we're seeing uh, the, the current you know, 20 to 30 somethings, uh, the millennials as we call them, um, are you know, tending toward more uh, renting than, than owning homes. And this can be seen, as you see on that chart, that uh, you know, the, the, the boomer generation or, or, or parent generation, uh, when they were their 20s and 30s back in the 1980s, their propensity to rent was uh, 60% versus you know, owner occupied of 35%. And over those years, the, the rental, the propensity to rent has increased you know, during, uh, among the, the different generations. And the, the millennials as of uh, today, in their 20s and 30s, um, you know, their, their propensity to rent is, is up you know, toward the 74% mark. And so there, that, that creates a, a larger pool of, of potential rental, renters out there, uh, therefore more demand, obviously. Um, the other trend, and this is probably more recent uh, in the last couple of years because of COVID-19, uh, we've seen some, some shift in preference, you know, in, in between uh, the, 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 the type of asset or the type of um, housing that these renters are seeking. Um, they're, they're trying to seek more, more space to be distanced away from, from uh, you know, other people, um, trying to move away from dense, dense uh, urban areas into probably less populated suburban um, you know, environments. And the remote work, uh, work from home uh, facilities have really enabled this, this capacity. Now you don't have to be, you know, uh, living in the middle of the city in order to commute every day. Now you can live a little further away and uh, you know, re work from home a, a few days a week. And that's what a lot of the companies are doing, uh, even those uh, who, which have transitioned back to office, you know, they're letting their, their employees to, to work from home uh, a few days a week. And, and I think that's a trend that's gonna stay. Um, so and, and we'll see that in, in some of the, the statistics that we'll cover um, you know, you know, following this, this, this slide. Uh, why now? Uh, this probably is, is more you know, felt throughout um, if you're living here in the US, um, but you know, the, the housing market over the last few years have been really you know, crazy. Uh, I think that's probably the one word that I would use. Um, they're ultra competitive uh, housing markets. Um, if you don't, you know, submit an offer that's above the asking price, I don't think you're even considered. Um, historically low inventory rates is, is what we also see. Um, so, and this shows up in, 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 in statistics. Um, the Case-Shiller Composite Index, which uh, tracks the single family home prices uh, across the nation um, is reporting that, you know, we're seeing a, a, a close to a 19% increase year over year uh, as of uh, you know, uh, Q4 of, of last year. So as I promised, a couple of statistics to kind of showcase uh, the, the theses that we had just uh, gone over. Um, with regard to you know, people and the trends um, of moving away from urban centers to suburbs, um, this graph shows a, a pretty interesting uh, chart uh, following the, the US, uh, United States Postal Service data of uh, change of address requests. So on your left, you see, uh, you know, comparing from pre-COVID to COVID uh, years, the, the number of uh, change of address requests uh, that moved away from the urban centers. So if you see uh, anything that's below this, this midline is net outflow, anything above is net inflow. 
So what you see here is uh, in urban centers, there were a net outflow uh, or in USPS terms, uh, net uh, uh, change of address out of the urban centers. Um, and actually, you know, 82% of urban centers saw people moving out. On your right, uh, as, as, as compared to, um, this is a suburban counties. And in suburban counties, you see that there's a, a very big net influx of, of uh, you know, address changes. And actually 91% of all the suburban counties saw people moving in. So, you know, this kind of corroborates the, the uh, real-time data of how, you know, the population is moving from, you know, urban to suburban counties. Uh, you know, during these COVID times. And another uh, statistic to kind of showcase the, the, the change in, um, in, in, in trends and in, in, in propensity. Um, and this is looking at within uh, the SFR, um, you know, rental properties um, between detached, meaning uh, standalone homes, uh, versus attached means meaning that you know it's either a duplex or triplex or a townhome type where you're sharing a, a one or two walls with your neighbors. Um, so as you can see, it, 2020 was was truly an inflection point. Until that time, you can see that those two kind of you know trend together, meaning there were wasn't a a defined uh, a preference over attached versus detached. However, uh, you know, after COVID, you're seeing more people and, and, and more people pre putting a premium on detached units, and, and it's you know it's actually beating the the attached uh, unit for 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 preference and and premium. So detached SFR units seems like it's the 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 uh, post pandemic favorite and the winner here. And going back, uh, going to the demand side of, of the equation and what that looks like, um, you know, we're looking at, okay, what's the total stock of rental units um, and uh, from, from a, a, a supply side uh, view? And, you know, over the years, it has increased steadily. However, um, due to the 2008 financial crisis, you can see that it, it kind of starts to stagger and it uh, slows down in terms of the, the supply. And over the last you know, six, seven years, it's pretty been stagnant. And if you juxtapose that with the uh, vacancy rates of those units, you can see a clear picture that um, you know, during the, or prior to the, the housing bubble in 2008, you can see that the vacancy rate was going up, going up, going up, and, and hitting you know, 10% uh, during the height of that, that housing crisis. And since then, with the, a, a stagnant supply of, of uh, rental properties, the vacancy rate precipitously drops, and currently we're at about 6.3% vacancy rate, which is a historical low. So what are all the other, you know, smart money, as we call them, the Wall Street in institutional investors, what are they doing about all this? And so the, we've had the same uh, list of, of uh, investments that were, you know, made public that we could gather in the past three uh, or past two, I should say, uh, webinars that we hosted. And this list keeps on growing. And the last one we had on Mansfield, Texas, uh, the reserve at Mansfield, Texas, it was, uh, I would say about what, six months ago or, or less than six months ago. Um, and since then we've added another, you know, three, which you see in blue, uh, LaSalle just, uh, you know, announced a $300 million investment into single family rental home uh, properties. Goldman Sachs is upping their game and uh, they, they announced another 300 million. Uh, Invitation Homes and Pulte Group uh, committed to buying 7,500 homes over the next five years. So 
it, you can see there are billions and billions of, of capital moving into this uh, this space um, as it's probably the the last kind of uh, wild west that's left in in the, in the commercial real estate sector with with um, prospect of high growth. But the crazy thing is that uh, all these monies uh, and, and the institutional investors in this overall single family market um, is only 2% of, of the overall stock. Um, still uh, over 85% of the market is owned by you know, mom and pop individual investors um, having you know, less than 10 homes, more like you know, one or two that they have that uh, they're, they're renting out. Um, and so I think everyone is seeing the, the, the tremendous growth that could happen in this space. Um, the, and, and going back, going on to uh, more of a location analysis, and again, these are, have been covered in, in the previous two SFR series webinars. Um, so you're more than welcome to, to, you know, to review them. But, um, you know, for those of us who are uh, less familiar with the DFW metro area, um, it's the fourth largest um, MSA uh, in the U.S. Uh, we're counting about uh, 7.5 million uh, residents, um, and, and it's growing um, every day. Um, as, as you will see uh, following this, this slide, there are corporate um, headquarters and people moving in from other parts of the U.S. into Dallas, Texas, in general, um, every day. Uh, DFW uh, has seen a 15% population growth since 2010, and, and, and you know it, it's truly amazing how, how every day there is a a California license plate, a New York license plate that we see on the road, and this happens every day uh, when I commute to work. Um, Texas is business and tax friendly. There is no state income tax. Um, the job opportunities um, are very, very good. Uh, there's a diversified uh, base, industry base, um, you know, energy, you name it, services, manufacturing, IT, um, it's all here. Um, the DFW average wage is over the, the average of, of of uh, Texas in general, uh, 67,000 versus $62,000. Uh, whereas uh, the median amount of rent spent as a portion of income is less than uh, you know, the 30% mark, which is typically the, um, the kind of the, the min mark that when we talk about um, how much of a, of a rent um, you know, should you expend you know, from your income. And the, the figure for US is, is approximately 30%. So which shows that the, the, the cost of living here is cheaper with a higher you know, average wage. Um, this is a, a, a quick graphic of um, all the inbound migration into Texas. Um, and you know, there are too many to name all of the, the, uh, the firms that have moved in. But um, I think, uh, Tesla announced that their headquarter is moving to, to their new Austin location. Um, you know, it was just their Gigafactory previously, but uh, I think they just said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll pack up everything and, and move to, to Texas. Um, continued migration it, it, over the, the COVID years um, actually has been good for, for Texas. Um, and, you know, 16,000 households moved from California, and this is up you know, 19% from the 2019 figure, 4,500 households from New York. And these are all, again, USPS data. So, you know, it's pretty uh, real time. Um, and firms like Toyota, North America headquarters, uh, JP Morgan Chase, um, Samsung, CBRE, Oracle, Charles Schwab, they all have a, 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 a big, a large, meaningful presence here uh, in, in Texas. And, um, Keep in mind about Toyota, JP Morgan, um, and I, actually JC Penney is here too, uh, in, in your minds, as we will see in, in, in the later slides, because they're only about 10 minutes away from our, our link project. Um, 
And there is another 200 or so active relocation and expansion projects in the pipeline, according to the DFW um, Alliance, which um, kind of tracks the, the economic activity of, of, uh, of Dallas and, and DFW in general. Um, so, you know, there's, there's definitely more to come. And kind of zooming in onto uh, Frisco, Texas, which is the, the, the location of our, uh, our, our link um, property. Uh, there's so many things to talk about Frisco. Um, I would first say that it's a, it's a very you know, good place to live. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's always ranked as the top five of the best uh, you know, places to live. Uh, it actually ranked number one, um, uh, a few years back by money.com as the best place to live in, 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 in the country. Um, Frisco and McKinney, uh, I think they, they always rank at the top of that, that list. Um, and uh, Frisco has actually ranked number one for the fastest growing city in North America over the uh, past 10 years. So if you go to Frisco, it's uh, the number of cranes are just you know, mesmerizing. Um, the uh, Frisco is, is obviously a northern suburb of, of DFW. Um, it's approximately 30 miles from downtown Dallas and 10 miles from Legacy West Plano, which is a very big employment center. And then we'll see that uh, in the, on the following chart, uh, uh, slide. Um, school is something to, to you know, definitely mention. Uh, Frisco has excellent schools, public schools. Um, they're ranked um, as, as an A grade by Texas Education Agency with an overall score of, of 93. So, uh, you know, it's a very competitive school system, uh, independent school district, um, very proud of it. Um, and uh, Frisco announced a, 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 a pretty interesting concept called Sports City USA, um, the, the STAR, uh, which is the headquarter, the training ground for the Dallas Cowboys is in Frisco, uh, alongside the, the Dallas North Tol Tollway um, that uh, links uh, the, the overall Frisco economy uh, and, and, and Dallas down, uh, downtown. Um, and uh, FC Dallas, uh, a, a MLS team, is also located in, in Frisco, in downtown Frisco. And then our, our link project, which uh, is also going to be uh, next to the PGA headquarters. Um, and we'll see that again uh, in the following uh, slides. Um, Frisco overall has great uh, transportation options. Uh, as you can see, this, it, these three are, are the main arteries of the DFW or this you know, section of, of DFW. Uh, Dallas North Tollway is a north-south uh, tollway that links uh, Frisco to all the way downtown uh, Dallas. Uh, Sam Raven Tollway or Texas 121 is a uh, uh, east-west uh, connection. And taking that road, um, you, you get to DFW Airport um, in about 20, 30 minutes. So it's a pretty easy uh, drive. Um, Texas 75 is another artery that uh, connects, again, uh, the uh, downtown Dallas and in and, and, uh, and the northern neighborhoods. Now, this is a, a quick map of uh, commute patterns um, in that area. So as you can see, our, our project here is, is here. And uh, this is the, the Dallas North Tollway that we just saw. And the, a lot of the bubbles here that represent the, the, the legacy West. Uh, it, it was a, a $3 billion uh, mixed use uh, facility with you know, uh, corporate offices, uh, headquarters, um, Retail centers, a hotel, uh, all the amenities that that you know is required for you know a, a successful uh, work, live, um, and play environment, and uh, you can see that the a lot of the the population surrounding, uh, so the commute time, average commute time to uh, the Legacy West was uh, about ten minutes, meaning. Um, you know, this circle around this uh, Legacy West is, is, is probably uh, pr pretty important in terms of 
uh, you know, feeding and, and, and housing the, the employees in, on the center. And Legacy West is where the Toyota North America headquarters is located. Uh, JC, uh, JP Morgan Chase has a regional headquarter there. Um, JC Penney's headquarter is there and, and Liberty Mutual and the list goes on. Um, for those of, of you who have uh, participated in our storybook um, project, uh, storybook is here. And so again, if you draw a circle around that Legacy West, it's, it's about 10 miles uh, from, from the link as well as from storybook. A quick look at, at, at the demo of, of Frisco, Texas. Um, as you can intuitively see, um, it's, a, it's a younger population, 37 years in median age. Uh, it's a high earning population, median household income came in at about $127,000 um, annual income. Um, and that's a, a pretty big jump from the Texas median annual income, which, is, which was $61,000. Um, and if you break that down further, 38% um, of the households were in the $100,000 to $200,000 um, income bracket. 23% uh, was over 200,000. So, you know, effectively over 60% of, of the, uh, the household income were, you know, in the, in the you know, plus $100,000 $100, um, level. Um, again, education is a is, is highly educated population. Um, as you can see, uh, you know, people with at least an associate's degree accounted for you know, the vast majority of, of the, the population. Um, and uh, a quick uh, note to, the, again, the supply side of, of, of the equation um, in this DFW area, um, we're seeing a chronic uh, housing shortage overall. And this shows a negative availability, meaning you know, shortage of, of supply stock. Um, and this has, you know, been persistent for, for a few years now. And uh, you can see that, you know, as of late, there's still about, you know, 23, 20, uh, 23,000 units of, of, uh, of, of deficit in terms of uh, uh, supply. Now, uh, the, the, we're, we're, again, zooming in more into uh, the actual uh, landscape and, and the, the location of our, our link SFR project. Uh, the highlighted in, in yellow section, this is where the, the link is going to be located. It's part of a larger uh, PGA headquarter development um, and, and uh, Stillwater Capital was able to, to uh, invite and uh, bring over PGA uh, of America from Florida to Frisco, Texas. And currently they're, they're building out a new PGA headquarter building. They're building out all the amenities and, and retail centers. Um, Omni Hotel is uh, building a, a very large uh, hotel and resort with a large convention space um, there. And we're also going to have a 36 hole championship uh, golf course. And they've already announced that this is going to be a public course. Uh, PGA's, uh, you know, uh, motto is to, to, you know, make golf available to, to a wider audience. And so, you know, they decided to, to make this a public course. Um, and the exciting thing is that uh, the events, the, the PGA golf um, tournaments are already scheduled out to 2032. We're actually going to see a, the, the actual PGA Cup um, hosted here. We're going to see myriads and number, you know, many, many uh, championship uh, uh, tournaments here. Um, and I think Ryder Cup is also being talked about. Um, and so there's a lot happening. This overall development was a, a, a package of a $520 million uh, development. And they're eyeing a 2023 completion. So, uh, it, you know, it's a, it's a very active um, site area. And what, what the, the 
the massive developer. So Stillwater did was uh, carve out a section here, as you see in, in the blue highlight area, um, to build out a, another multi-use um, space. So they're gonna have some entertainment venues, they're gonna have um, offices and uh, multifamily units uh, as a mixed use urban um, center and our link SFR. Um, so the, the link uh, SFR that, that we're uh, committing to um, is gonna be perched on a, on, a, on a bit of a hilltop. And so it's gonna have a, a great view of the, uh, the overall uh, golf course. And it's also gonna have a, a connection into the, the golf course through a kind of a promenade, uh, a, a, you know, a green lush, um, you know, walkable um, distance. Exciting. <laughs> um, okay, so a uh, little more detail about the actual um, Link SFR uh, development plan. It's uh, going to be built over about a, a 30 acre um, uh, infill development. Um, we're uh, zoned for 214 units. Um, and the, the under an average month. Uh, monthly rate uh, rent is uh, about twenty eight hundred dollars, or you know, two point two dollars per square foot, um, and we'll, we'll see what that means in terms of the overall market, and uh, to to get a better sense of what that means, and which is the basis of our our underwriting. Um, the average unit size is, is again; these are detached units, uh, as as uh, we we talked about. Um, it's going to have a one bedroom option, two bed, three bedroom option. Going from 850 square foot, um, you know, units to you know 16 uh, to close to 1700 square foot units. Um, Aminis are going to be pristine. Uh, they're going to have fitness facility. They're going to have resort style pools, um, and you know that that was going to match this kind of you know lifestyle. Um, again, um, it's uh, it's a very uh, it, it's adjacent almost adjacent to the Dallas North Tollway, which gives you great access to, you know, essentially everywhere in, in the DFW, you know, metro area. Um, the distance to uh, Dallas downtown is going to be about 30 miles. And as I mentioned to Legacy West, which is probably the, the, the bigger, you know, employment center that's closer to, it, it, that's kind of the anchor of the, the northern uh, suburb is gonna be about 10 miles or uh, uh, from, from this, uh, from our, our, our project. Now going back to that uh, rent uh, per square foot um, analysis. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, the link is gonna be at around, you know, 2.2 per, per um, square foot, um, 2.23 um, in, in, in average. And um, there aren't many direct comparables because um, you know, there aren't many of these SFR properties uh, in this area. Um, Avila Parkway is one. And it, it, if you, again, if you were uh, part of the storybook uh, offering, then I think you, you, you might be familiar with this name, but uh, it's, a, it's a SFR that's probably the direct comparison. And um, you know, it was built recently in 2021, so last year. Uh, it's already all you know fully leased out, um, and they're renting at two point four dollars today. So you can get a sense of you know how how uh, what our rate um, means you know in, in comparison to that. Um, and the other comparables that we see uh, scattered around and uh, you know the, the uh, our, our project area, they're all mostly uh, uh, multifamily. Uh, properties. So uh, you, you, should, you have to have that in mind. And we adjust it, um, you know, for, uh, in order to compare these multifamilies to what it would be, um, you know, to make an apple to apple, as close to a, as an apple to apple comparison to an SFR project. So as you can see, multifamilies, uh, again, they're, they're probably, you know, lower just in, in, in absolute terms in, in rent per square footage. Uh, but not really. The, the links at PJ Parkway already is, you know, at that $2.2 um, level. So now, um, 
how do we compare, uh, you know, uh, horizontal or, or single family rental properties to typical, um, you know, multifamily suburban apartments? Well, so um, Zonda Advisory is a, is a market research firm that uh, Stillwater, um, you know, has, has uh, worked with uh, previous, many times previously. Um, and so they, they did an analysis of, of the, uh, the premium that would be charged over a multifamily, you know, suburban apartment uh, for a horizontal, um, you know, single family rental property. And conclusion wise, what they saw over the, you know, the, the expanse of the market is that there is about a, a 27% to 51% premium for SFR uh, properties uh, as compared to traditional, you know, wrap and garden, meaning just to traditional multifamily apartments that you see, um, you know, scattered around the country. So uh, reflecting that, then what that becomes is, um, Going back to this page, this I'm just going to pick one, uh, anyone. The one point, you know, seven seven um, dollar uh, per square foot uh, multifamily apartment, you know, is comparable to if you add a fifty percent, you know, premium to that, um, you know, two point three, two point four uh, per square foot, uh, is you know, comparing it, it to a, a SFR. So again, comparing that to our project, which is at about 2.25 per square foot, you can see that you know uh, that the market it, it, we're, pretty, we're targeting a pretty competitive you know price point for for our property. Um, these are some some preliminary and uh, you know early renderings of of the the property itself. Um, beautiful. Uh, the investment timeline. Um, so uh, we're expecting to construct, commence construction uh, toward the the latter end of the second quarter of 2022, um, and we're expecting about a 20 month construction. Phase and there, it's going to be phased into you know phase one and phase two to kind of you know be able to to, to optimize the the construction time frame. Um, and after construction completion in in uh, in early 2024, uh, we're expecting to you know have another you know six month or so of a very short stabilization and then an additional a couple of years of of operation before we're able to exit. And exit here means um, likely a, a, a sale event of the property. Um, and that's where the bulk of the investment return will, will come in. Um, capital source explanation quickly. Um, so this overall, the, the budget for this overall project is, is $83 million. And uh, we're expecting to get a senior lender construction loan of, of uh, $54 million, uh, a mezzanine piece of, of 12.5, um, 13 there about million dollars. Um, our equity as a 90% uh, partner into this venture is gonna be uh, a tad less than $15 million with the sponsor equity by Stillwater Capital um, coming in at, at, at 1.66 million dollars. Um, the uh, I'll skip this for now. Um, the NHK uh, within the NHK Link uh, Limited Partnership, um, the uh, the the again the 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 equity requirement I, I'm sorry the, the equity requirement for this project as I mentioned is you know uh, 15 million dollars or 14.98 from NHK uh, and another 1.6 from from the Stillwater uh, manager slash sponsor equity um, so it's going to total to about 16.6 percent uh, we have negotiated and this the, the hurdle structure is the same uh, across the, the other three, other two, I should say, um, SFR projects. And we have, uh, you know, hurdle structures whereby uh, the Stillwater Capital Managers promotes is subordinated to the back end. 
And so um, NHK gets the, the first preferred return of 10% uh, compounded uh, preferred return on its investment. Uh, there's a second hurdle of 16%. Um, and at the end, if, if the, the project uh, you know, excels and really hits it out of the park, then the Stillwater manager gets a promote at the back end, and we're sharing that that back end uh, profit 50, 50 between the the NHK partner and the Stillwater partner. This is obviously to motivate the 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 uh, the sponsor, the Stillwater uh, partner, to do the best they can and and yield the best results possible. Um, and coming in and, and focusing on the actual uh, NHK link um, limited partnerships. So this is our investment vehicle. Um, the offering term for our limited partners are gonna be, uh, we're expecting a four year target investment term. This again uh, is an equity investment. So this could be shorter, this could be longer, but you know, this is, I think we, we think we're targeting this four year um, uh, period. Um, and uh, we are going to open uh, for a live subscription um, beginning in the next week or so. And we will um, run until um, about early May of 2022 uh, on our um, offering. Um, there is a 5% a subscription fee. Uh, so if you invest in, in a minimum investment of $100,000, so if you invest $100,000, then uh, the math is that $95,000 will go into the actual investment and, and 5% will be your, 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 the, the, um, the partnership's uh, subscription fee. Um, a, a note on the partnership structure. So the, again, uh, it has a, a two-year construction phase and, and, uh, and then there's a, a ramp up phase or a stabilization period. And then uh, an operation period uh, followed by a, uh, an exit. So during this operation uh, or the, the, the bulk of the, the operational phase, um, the cash flow is going to be minimal. Um, the, 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 the bulk of the return is going to be upon liquidation events on the fourth year or, or the, whenever that, that liquidation happens, I should say. Um, annual, annual management fee is, is uh, waived for the first uh, three years. Uh, it only starts um, collecting a 2% annual management fee uh, starting in July of 2025. So there's really you know, not that big of a window that the annual, annual management fee will be charged. Uh, and GP is entitled to a 20% profit as a carried interest. Uh, and again, this is um, the identical structure that we've uh, uh, you know, offered in, in the previous deals. Um, target partnership cash flow, we're expecting about a 2x return, um, you know, during that, that four-year term. Uh, in IR terms, I think we're, we're um, targeting 28%. Again, this is a, a, uh, a, a partnership level cash flow. So from this, um, you know, we're going to be, uh, have a waterfall of all the partnership structure that we just talked about. Um, so, the actual return to the LPs will be you know, slightly different um, you know, from, from depending on when you invest and, and things of that nature. Uh, we can definitely you know, walk you through that in, in better detail. We as in Matthew, Temple and I, uh, if uh, you're interested and, and you know, give us a call. Um, a, quickly on, on our, our partner Stillwater, um, we've done many, many deals with Stillwater through our CMB platform as a, as a mezzanine lender and through NHK. Um, and uh, Stillwater themselves is a, is, a, is a force to be reckoned with. Um, you know, they have, uh, this is still a little dated, so right now they probably have more under their, their belt. But um, they have about $8 billion in real estate transactions, um, 90 plus member team. They're, they're everywhere. They're, uh, I talked to Aaron Sherman and, you know, he's in one place on one day, another on the other, uh, on a, another day. So they have offices in Dallas, Frisco, Austin, Phoenix, Nashville. Uh, they're venturing out to, to Colorado. Um, North Carolina is another market that we're looking at. Um, and, uh, you know, the... the 
the, the pictures you see are all of the, the projects that, that, or I should say not all, but um, you know, Crosby is one that we were involved in and these multifamilies um, were uh, also uh, are involved, we were involved in as, as a CMB, you know, mezzanine lender. Um, there's a, again, as I mentioned, uh, we have a, a very long history of, of uh, collaboration between the two. Um, the, the, the good thing about Stillwater is their, their, their business plan, their, their business model really, you know, works well with, in, in, in conjunction with us. Um, they are able to usually, you know, construct and sell each asset on an average about 3.3 years from breaking ground. Um, and um, so far, and, and, and you know, thank you to, to thanks to, to the, the bull market uh, in, in, in part, but um, they're always able to overachieve their, the, the, the performer, the underwriting. Um, lastly, a shout out to our first uh, NHK partnership, NHK Augusta LP. Um, and uh, for those of you who, it, it, we, we, we started at HK um, and it branched out of, of CMB regional centers as, as we saw uh, back in 2018. Uh, we had a vision, we, we, we saw what this could be, you know, leveraging our, our knowledge, leveraging our team, um, leveraging the, 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 the network and the, the, the business uh, connections that we, we have through CMB. Um, and so we ventured out and we had, uh, you know, people, we had our, our original, the, the first investors who shared that vision and who were, you know, risk takers and said, okay, this sounds like a good idea. I'm going to go with NHK. And so, um, and I'm glad to, to see that it paid off. Um, our first project, the uh, Augusta Street Loft in, in San Antonio, again, with Stillwater Capital. Um, came to fruition um, actually about 28 months ahead of, of the targeted pull period of, of, of five years. And they were, we were able to achieve the, the same level of equity multiple, uh, meaning the, the, from an IRR kind of metric, uh, you know, it, it essentially doubled the, the IRR metric. So congratulations to them. Um, and, uh, you know, thank you for, for putting that trust in us. Um, I went a little longer than I, I wanted to. I apologize for that. Um, so uh, again, um, these uh, this webinar is going to be uh, recorded. It is being recorded. It will be posted on our website, uh, nhkpartnerscapitalpartners.com, or you can uh, give us a call uh, or, or email info at nhkcapitalpartners.com, um, and then we'll be able to respond. Um, I have Matthew Temple, uh, my uh, director of uh, investment operations. Um, he's going to probably try to gather some questions um, and go yeah, from go there. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I uh, actually answered some live, but I, I, I left one that I think would be good for you to address. And in the meantime, anyone else, if you could just start um, submitting your questions in the Q&A, uh, we'd greatly appreciate it. Um, one of the questions that we had is, um, we all know there's war in Ukraine and that the potential Fed rate hikes are you know, on the future outlook. Um, this with inflation, interest rates expected to go up. Uh, you know, what's our position on this and what is our forecast of how this could potentially affect our project? Wow. Uh, thank you for the question. It's, it's a very profound question. Um, <laughs> So I'll, I guess I'll, I'll do my best to kind of see, it, talk about it from, from, from my perspective. And, and um, the, first off, we've seen a, an increase in, in price levels, uh, inflation, I should say, uh, in the past you know, year or so. And uh, if you compare again the very similar product types, you know types of construction. Again, this um, the link being a little more on the high end than than you know say uh, the previous two. Uh, we've seen a, 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 a substantial increase in, in price level, and so whereas uh, compared to say Storybook, um, this one has probably I would say about 
about a, a eight, seven, eight, you know, 10% price increase overall. Um, and so we're factoring that in, uh, but also the, the, the matter with inflation is that it, it, it's a, it's a high that raises you know, all boats. So I, we think that there's going to be some sort of a, a uh, kind of a net effect, if you will, uh, in terms of asset price inflation as well. Um, the, you also mentioned the, the war uh, with, with Ukraine and uh, the resulting, um, I guess, you know, uh, interest rate hikes um, that, that might affect our, our property. Um, so the, again, I don't know how the interest rate will, will move from here. Um, I think the, the expectation in the marketplace is also that uh, the, the Fed uh, that are you know, aggressively targeting inflation might maybe take a breather uh, because of Ukraine. And so far, we, we're, we're tracking the, you know, the all the um, the interest rates uh, indexes. So LIBOR, SOFR, prime rate, uh, and you know, with all the the talk about inflation, yes, we've seen a, a, an increase, but the increase itself was, you know, sub. I, I think at most like 0.6, so 60 basis points or 0.6 percent. So uh, what that does is the actual uh, interest rate, uh, you know, charged to a specific project like ours, uh, it might slightly go up, but it's not, you know, tanking the, the actual deal itself uh, or, or, you know, making it unfeasible to, to, to go forward with the, uh, the investment. Now, with regard to what will happen in four years time, I don't think I'm qualified to say what will happen in four years' time. Uh, but what we do rely on is, as, as we saw, you know, time after time, and that's probably one of the reasons why we wanted to, you know, with the risk of repeating ourselves, kind of show, show you what the demand versus supply uh, situation is in the housing market. And there's a reason why the housing you know, market has, you know, gone up as it did in the last few years is because the, 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 the supply is, is somewhat stagnant. And uh, whereas the, the, the demand itself has, has a, a, a healthy you know, growth factored into it. Uh, if you come to Texas and, and DFW, um, I think that uh, kind of discrepancy, that gap between demand and supply uh, ex it increases you know, multiple folds. That's because uh, you know there's a, a constant migration into Texas, following jobs, following you know better economics, um, and and uh, you know I guess a better better living standard uh, with the same amount of dollars you know as compared to say some of the uh, the coastal areas. So with that. Um, Again, I don't know what will happen exactly in four years' time, but we're, we're betting that the supply and demand will carry us, you know, um, so far. Yeah, maybe um, we can go back to this slide where it talked about the disposition and the cap rate. Uh, you know, our cap rate we used uh, for the underwriting metrics versus what we recently reviewed for the Q4 2021 DFW Pacific uh, mm -hmm. cap rate. If you want to kind of maybe go into that, I think that it helps with... Um, Explaining the strength of the DFW SFR asset class. I think it's uh, go back towards the way. Yeah. So again, uh, so we we can we can talk about cap rates as well. Uh, I mean, you know, right now the oops, sorry. Um, uh, but the so the, the cap rate itself uh, is currently really compressed. I mean the 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 latest cap rate that we're seeing is sub four percent. And for those of you who aren't really familiar with what, what cap rates are, it's it's a metric uh, in, in commercial real estate to to you know essentially measure the the, the market price of of these uh, commercial real estate assets. So um, typically when we quote a capital rate, the lower it is means that the, the, the property itself has a higher valuation. 
And uh, the, 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 the latest cap rates we saw in the marketplace for these you know, residential properties, commercial re residential properties, were sub 4%, uh, which is historically low. Again, uh, you know, with all the, 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 um, the, the uh, factors that the, the questioner mentioned, uh, Aaron, I believe, that these might, you know, maybe go up a little, but there, there's still a lot of room for, for it to, to you know, uh, go back up um, because truly the sub 4% uh, cap rate is, is you know, is a historical. Okay. Yep. Um, there's another question. Does the link SFR target PGA employees, professionals working, leaning at the PGA as a major customer? Um, sure. So, uh, so a, a quick disclaimer. Um, the PGA headquarter uh, project, which again uh, encircles the the PJ headquarter build out, the 36 uh, whole championship golf course uh, and, and the Omni Hotel Performance Center, Convention Center, um, they're, they're distinct and they're unrelated to the, the our NHK Link SFR project. Um, however, uh, so there isn't a, 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 a contractual, um, I should say, you know, relationship between you know those working at PGA uh, with our property, but if you're a walking distance from your work, and uh, you know you have one of the the, the better uh, you know uh, property pro positions there, um, and by the way, uh, one thing I found very interesting was um, Stillwater, who's again developing the the rest of the mixed use urban area as well as the entertainment venue. Um, they're looking at. Uh, giving away golf carts, uh, customized golf carts for the uh, um, the the tenants, the the office tenants in, in this area, uh, which I think is, is pretty brilliant. It, it gives you the the sense of being at a golf course, um, and also it, it allows you to to move around. And I think that's that that's uh, in line with what I think is going to happen, which is. The, the 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 folks who are you know the professionals who are working at PGA and the 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 surrounding you know uh, office buildings, they're going to want to live here. And so again, there's not a a contractual relationship there, but I think it's poised well, and that's why this uh, the NHK Link is one of the first um, phases of this mixed use urban area overall. Because you know, uh, before you have you know people move in into your offices, you, you want to provide a place to live. I agree, and one thing to note is um, the school district, uh, as you can see on this image, it's called the Panther Creek. This high school is actually uh, newly built and will come live in the spring of this year. The students that play golf at this uh, high school will actually get to call up the PGA course, uh, one of the eighteen holes home. So I think it'll attract, um, you know, younger professionals who seek to maybe uh, pursue college or uh, even in a professional someday. Maybe the family uh, lives uh, in somewhere in Texas and they, they know about this and that their son lives at this school or can attend this school. They can um, they can play at this course uh, more challenging. So I think that's also an attraction for younger families or uh, golf oriented families. Great. Okay. So how much time is allowed to make the whole investment? Um, I'm assuming this is going to be for transferring uh, your investment funds in. Uh, as Neil mentioned, it is a minimum uh, investment of 100000 And we anticipate with the current interest that we already have accumulated that uh, this will close sometime by the end of May, if not mid to early May. So it's truly first come, first serve. Uh, you have to submit uh, an NDA in order to receive the offering documents. And from there, we would go through the approval process and then this would be a transfer. So I would say sometime mid-May. And to address the question below, um, yes, it's a minimum of 100000 and the increments thereafter are in 50000 So, um, you know, first 100000 and then you can go up to 150, 200, 250, uh, 400, whatever you please. But they have to be in 50,000 increments. 
Right. So uh, we we do it by by unit. So one unit uh, is is fifty thousand dollars. So it's a minimum of two units, therefore hundred thousand dollar minimum investment. And then thereafter, it's it's uh, one unit increment, meaning fifty thousand dollar increment, as, as Matthew mentioned. Uh, another question came in. Uh, in recent industry projects, uh, like we've seen with Storybook and the Reserve, we've seen uh, after you know we've rolled out the investment, that there's been increased costs due to the um, kind of uh, supply chain disruption. Have the measures been effectively mitigated for this project? Um, nice to see you, David. Um, yes. So so we're we're constantly ca calibrating. So the. Uh, I, you're mentioning storybook um, that had a a uh, additional raise um, in order to uh, to raise additional funds um, to cover the the construction um, you know the overall uh, uh, price increase and uh, what we're doing here in, in link is we're, we're kind of you know learning from that and also, what kills the bird, the the cat is is you know not curiosity but all the the, the uncertainty. So uh, what we had in storybook was we were at the cusp of kind of you know migrating transitioning from kind of a um, a stabilized you know supply market to a tumultuous you know one. And so we had a very hard time trying to get actual quotes from the subcontractors. Uh, because they were just afraid that, you know, to, to give out quotes that, that were binding because they didn't know what, you know, the, the next week held. And that's why, uh, as compared to the original budget, we saw a, an increase. And um, right now, learning from that and, and, and calibrating from that, uh, we um, have a, a higher... Uh, construction budget already baked in, and um, the the uncertainty is somewhat mitigated because now, yes, it albeit at a at a slightly higher level. Um, so, uh, just to give you a, a quick uh, a quote, uh, the per square foot construction price, uh, hard construction costs um, in storybook started at, uh, at about $185, if I remember. Um, and on the link, we're uh, reflecting uh, $200 per square foot. So there is definitely an increase, and we're factoring that in already. Um, however, the, the uncertainty or the fluctuation, I should say, is, is um, you know, rather mitigated from Storybook. So we don't expect this to have a, another, you know, additional fundraise um, kind of situation. Um, but again, the when we calculate out the targeted returns and targeted, um, you know, returns to our investors, uh, most more importantly, uh, we're factoring in the higher level of of of, uh, of cost. Yeah, to jump right into uh, kind of a similar question if the interest rates go up in the market i would expect the cap rate needs to go higher for institutional investors hence it would lower the value of the property is this correct um i mean maybe we can go into our so our dfw q4 analysis that we saw where we saw uh, an average 3.5 percent cap rate and the cap rate that we are projecting and using for our uh, underwriting is 4.75 so we have quite a bit of cushion what the actual market is is performing at versus what we're underwriting at and we've talked with many professionals who you know see that the squeeze on this asset class single family rentals even if there are a few federal hikes they they uh, anticipate that if there is in fact it would it would be you know very minimal due to the strength of the asset class i don't know if you have anything else to add well, yeah. So, so Aaron, uh, again, a, a, a good point um, and definitely a valid point. But I think it's it's just a, a one facet of a of a multifaceted you know uh, question. So, yes. So you know, intuitively, if if the rate goes up, then yes, cap rate probably needs to go up um, for the institutional investors. But it also depends on the actual you know uh, again supply and demand and what the institutional investors are trying to achieve. 
So uh, we, we saw that list of, of the institutional investors kind of moving into this space um, and not, so the link or the SFR series that we have had, um, they're all, you know, one location, you know, 20 acre, 25 acre, you know, 200 plus uh, newly built single family rental units that are uh, centrally managed and centrally, uh, you know, serviced. And therefore, it's a, it, it, in itself, it's a very, uh, you know, highly sought after, you know, asset type, you know, for these institutional investors. So compare that to trying to, you know, buy 75,000, uh, 7,500 7, homes, as we saw. It's a daunting task. And the way they do that, if, if you really look at the actual, you know, kind of picking up, you know, purchasing um, uh, process of, of these institutional investors of homes, is they don't really care about the underlying, you know, price of that, you know, specific home. The aggregation is where the the, the value add is. So if you if you're uh, an individual investor that has two homes under your your uh, your 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 management, then you want to get the you know every dollar you can out of that sale. However, these investors, what they're looking at is aggregating enough to create a big enough you know portfolio so that they can sell it off to the next person, right? And and create a, a cash flow from it. And so. What that does, it, it, it creates a propensity to lower the cap rate. So it, typically these you know, cap rates that, that you know, you're, you're seeing these institutional investors buying up properties is record low. And that's why you're seeing sub 4% cap rates currently. And so as long as you know, the, 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 the prediction that these institutional investors, again, are only 2% of the overall stock, and with a lot of room to grow and in an environment where, you know, this war, as you mentioned, and uh, the, the increase in interest rates, uh, you know, there is going to be a squeeze on, on investable, I guess, areas. And, you know, one of the, the bright spots is probably this is SFR. So if, if assuming and, and, and premised on, you know, the institutional investors still, you know, uh, wanting to move into the space, I think it'll create a, a bit of a, a, a compressant in terms of cap rates. Yeah, and like, like you mentioned, our underwriting is at a 4.75, and with the current market hitting, uh, you know, sub four. If we were to even just hit a four percent cap rate based on our uh, you know, projected NOI, our appreciation and value would be approximately twenty million. And let's say we even get, um, you know, four, three years out and we still, you know, we're able to capitalize at what the current market's doing at 3.5 right. cap rate. That would be about a 37 million uh, you know, appreciation in value. So we think that, you know, at our cap rate at 4.75, it's conservative. So again, to, to, uh, to uh, supplement Matthew's point, when we go through the underwriting process, um, we, we, we try to err on the side of being conservative. So uh, I, I, we, we talked about in, in detail about the, the price per, per square foot um, and rent rate. And because that's kind of the, the basis of everything, right? That, that's, the, that's what creates NOI. And NOI or net operating income is what the, the, the valuation of the project will be based on. So again, cap rate, uh, or, so we try to be uh, conservative in, in what we, we predict our per square footage uh, rent rate will be, um, and also on the cap rates. As, as Matthew mentioned, we're seeing you know, very, very low cap rates, but we're, we're capping ourselves at the, at the four, 475 basis point level. And so uh, if you know, at the end there's a, a, a room for, for upside, you know, that's a better story for us than the other way around. So, um, yeah. Uh, one question is how would you describe the property type class A or class B? Um, this is gonna be a class A property. Uh, it's known to build these yeah. single family rentals. And uh, I know that, you know, the reason for the little bit higher cost 
uh, in comparison to our last two is we will have you know a little bit higher finishes on this one because of the, the area. So this is going to be for sure a class A brown. Um, and we have another question. Uh, what's the most significant risk and how do you intend to mitigate that risk? Um, so again, I think the, 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 the most significant risk, um, I guess I'll try to kind of classify that as a, as a foreseen and unforeseen. Um, the, the foreseen, I think we just talked about, um, you know, at a, at a compressed, you know, per square foot rental level, uh, at a compressed or, or you know, a, a worse off um, capital um, cap rate um, due to, you know, many factors that, that we, we discussed and, and due to factors that we don't know today. Uh, Conservatively, you know, are we still going to make money? Are we still, you know, be? Are we still going to be good um, to to move forward with this investment? That's always, you know, what's going on in our heads, and I think that's why we, we've come up with the 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 two point two as kind of the, you know, the I would say, you know, realistic but not overly optimistic um, level of of price. Uh, per square foot rent rate, and the the mention cap rate is is you know the same, and so I think inherently in our uh, uh, underwriting in, in our you know due diligence we've already underwritten that in, um, and so from a market perspective I think that's how we're trying to mitigate the risk, um, and you know it, this is a construction project so. From here on, you know, there are the, the inherent construction related, I guess, risks, um, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, what are you gonna find in the ground? Um, what happens if, you know, the construction stalls or, you know, uh, you know, prices go up and things of that nature, which we can all address, right? So first off, this is, used to be a ranch. And so it's, it's, it's a clean land. And so, you know, you're not going to find some contaminant once you start digging. So, you know, you have that. And we do have a clean, um, you know, ESA, which is an environment study, um, which is obviously part of our, our due diligence. Um, and from a construction perspective, um, you know, we've kind of learned from, from the past, we're, we're adjusting like everyone else to this new normal, um, you know, with the inflation, you know, living with the inflation, with the, the you know, all of the uh, uncertainties that, that surround us, including the war in, in Ukraine. Um, and uh, we're trying to buy out as many of the subcontracts as possible. Um, so we are yet to finalize the, the GMP but uh, we're using the same general contractor from you know, the previous jobs. So we, we get a better sense of, of where we're gonna end up in terms of price levels. And before we go hard uh, on our money, meaning you know, our money being committed for actual construction, we're gonna have a signed GMP with uh, a, 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 a uh, fixed budget. Uh, we're gonna you know, buy out most of the, the, the trades, the, the subcontractors so that you know, it's already all contracted and therefore, no, you know, uh, mitigate, you know, any fluctuation thereafter. Um, and um, and um, going on to the actual operational, uh, I think we're, we're covering that from the, the original underwriting of a lower, you know, rent rate as, as, as we talked about. Um, and ultimately the exit, right? So the exit, uh, while we, you know, we, we still think that the you know there are you know big fishes out there that are gonna want to kind of pick this up as, as soon as we're able to or, or you know want to sell this. Um, um, again, this is you know we're ninety percent owner of, you know of this project. So if you know this year doesn't really pan out because we would you know we we think we have, we need a better price, then we operate for another year. You know, so that that's that's I guess the the the, the best defense of of this investment. We're always going to be on ninety percent investment, and this is going to cash flow. 
Yeah, I, I guess to like back uh, back to your kind of thoughts there. I think you know, like you mentioned, significant risk is who is going to develop this, who's going to build it. You know, first of all, is completing the project, getting it to an operational point, and that's where we have worked with Stillwater on. You know, I think eleven previous developments, uh, many with CMB, and now this is be our fourth with NHK. And there's a reason why we partnered with them on NHK um, initially because they've been a partner who's been able to perform, um, they've been able to complete. Uh, build this and then stabilize and sell these properties very, very fastly and efficiently. Like Neil might have mentioned halfway through his presentation, we've seen them construct, build, and sell each one of our developments within 3.3 years. And they achieved uh, an 80% premium on our underwriting assumption. So when looking at uh, an investment like such, you get to look at who is you know the, the developer and the builder behind it. And um, you know that's what we do too. And Stillwater, we have uh, the most faith. Um, so the next question, can I see these projects in person? So actually, um, I will be uh, hosting uh, some site visits next week. Uh, some a colleague of mine and myself will be there the 16th, 17th and 18th. Right now, the 17th, we have uh, some site visits planned. We will be visiting uh, this project uh, early in the morning. Following this project, we will then go and actually look at our previous first SFR the progress on the development uh, in McKinney called Storybook. And then maybe we gather up for some lunch, uh, meet in the office for some coffee. And then in the afternoon, we will actually be visiting our JW Marriott, which was our second offering. We'll be swinging by there around 2 p.m. to look at the progress that has happened there. Um, so if you would like to attend, um, reach out uh, and uh, we can schedule either, you know, 16th or the 18th, but the 17th, we already have plans and you could gladly join. Yeah, so 17th is when, uh, you know, we're going to have a, a, a larger, I think a better presentation, if you will. Um, Stillwater is going to get involved, right? So right. I think you would probably get the best uh, if you're able to make on, the, on, on that 17th, which is next Thursday, right? Matthew? That's correct. Next Thursday, and our first uh, project tour will start at 10 a.m. at um, Frisco, the link, and then we'll go from there. So um, just uh, give us a call, an email, or, uh, you know, let us know how to contact you, and, and we can definitely, you know, put that in motion. Is the GP also committed to invest in this project with the previous one? If so, by how much? Um, so yes, uh, the Hogan's, as in every offering, they have committed to uh, funding at least 20% of this offering. Uh, you know, actually in the previous one, they, they, they might have taken a little bit more, but um, you know, this is something they've committed to and will always do on future offerings. And this one. So yes, they are so, at, at a minimum of 20% of the offering. Yeah, and, and I, I would uh, build up a little bit on that. Um, so it, I think, it'll help to understand the kind of the genesis of, of why NHK. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we, we, we saw this vision and um, there were, you know, a couple of things that were going on, you know, on our side. Uh, we have the CMB platform and, you know, it's been, you know, successful in its, you know, market in, in the EV5, you know, industry, you know, for the last 20, 25 years. And also, uh, the the principles of, of CMB, the Hogan family, you know, they they're also you know constantly looking at uh, you know places to invest, right? So um, we thought, okay, if we're out there already looking for investments for the you know the the, uh, the principles, let's invite our friends and family. And so NHK is exactly that. It's it's a club deal. It's it's a friends and family. Um, is how we started. So um, and. So every deal that we, um, you know, present to you, they are good for the money for the uh, the principals to invest their own. So uh, Matthew mentioned minimum twenty percent. I think uh, right now it's at about thirty percent um, or it, it, uh, of invested uh, from the the principals. So uh, and they don't get a preferen preferential treatment. Uh, they're they're you know still part of the the limited partnership uh, an LP uh, like yourself. Yep. 
Could you uh, re-explain the waterfall model for profit sharing? So I think first at the project level and then second at the partnership level. Matthew, do you wanna take that? Yeah, sure. Um, so we negotiated with Stillwater at the project level where the actually cash will be generated from the operations. Um, so what we've, we've done is negotiated uh, a waterfall split, which is uh, essentially three hurdles. Uh, hurdle one, which is all equity members uh, first get their money back with a 10% preferred return. And there's no bonus, no incentive for the, for the promote, for the, for the sponsor. Hurdle two, um, we then have to then achieve a 16% preferred return on our equity. Once that's achieved, the sponsor receives a 25% promote only at the hurdle two uh, benchmark. So if we were to be distributed a million dollars, for example, at the hurdle two, they would get $250,000 as a promote. So once we've achieved our money back and our preferred 16% return compounded, uh, should I mention, um, then after we achieve that, which I think is very, very good, we then go to a 50-50 split in which we say, hey, we've achieved what we've, you know, that we think it's a very appropriate number. Now we will split the remaining profits 50-50. Um, this model, we, you know, we think is very good. It incentivizes the developer to um, do the best, um, you know, reach the highest valuation in the quickest way possible. Um, once we receive our portion from that waterfall, the equity members, we then distribute our funds within the uh, NHK partnership of that, um, we actually give our investors their full investment back first. And then from there, um, the uh, percentage split is 80% goes to all the limited partners and then 20% goes to the GP as its interest carry. Is that pretty clear? Yeah, nothing to add. <laughs> Okay, um, any more questions? Okay, well, uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, again, you can find the recorded version of this web, uh, webinar on our website, uh, nhkcapitalpartners.com. Uh, you're more than welcome to reach out to us uh, via phone, email, um, or uh, info at nhkcapitalpartners.com. Um, and as, as we mentioned, uh, we're planning a site visit uh, next week, preferably on the 17th, which is Thursday of next week, um, so that, uh, you know, I think you will probably get the, the best out of the, the visits um, on that day. But, uh, you know, we also have on our calendars, um, you know, um, 16th and the 19th open for now. So uh, if you're interested, do uh, reach out to us. Um, additionally, uh, the offering documents is, uh, itself will uh, likely go live in the next uh, week or so. Um, so again, if you're interested, um, you know, let us know and we'll keep you uh, posted in terms of when the actual offering will be uh, ready and made available to you. Again, thank you for joining us um, and uh, hope you have a, a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.